Joined in the studio now by Sheriff Matt Saxton and Battle Creek Police Chief Jim Blocker. Morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Richard. Good well, you morning. know, we uh, we had a few things to uh, talk about, but we realized that, boy, these events over the last uh, several days and weeks give us a lot of things to talk about, and none of them have been really good. Uh, exactly uh, right. Uh, quite frankly, there aren't any of them I really wish to talk about. Yeah. Um, right. We've we've had seen some things locally that we don't ever want to deal with again, and uh, whether that's here in Calhoun or right next door at Kalamazoo. Right. Uh, but then we also keep those folks in Orlando in our prayers and thoughts. Let, let's talk a little about that for a second. Uh, you, will, I presume, like the rest of us, were watching that coverage, and and I presume when you see things like this in other places, you look at it from the perspective of your expertise and look at the way these things were handled and and um, what impressions do you come away with? So, well, immediately the impression is, you know, I don't tweet often, but I I tweeted right away and I, um, you know, I just said, what, another mass murder, mass event, um, simply tragic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, throughout this last few days, we I've been asked a number of times, are, you know, are we prepared for that? And frankly, no one can be prepared for an incident like that. Uh, this county's not prepared. Kalamazoo's not prepared. Uh, these are just devastating, critical events that really we are learning to, as a nation, how to respond to them. Um, I, I think that when it, when it comes to this, this, these types of extreme uh, activities, this was a murky uh, culmination of not only terrorism, but mixed with mental instability uh, and extremism. And, you know, and people want to finger point. That's what we're, we're seeing this week. They're talking to the ex-wife uh, of this uh, the suspect. Right. Uh, they, want to, well, they want answers. And, frankly, in these scenarios, I don't know if we're going to get the answers that we all crave for right now. Uh, but I think uh, as we talk forward and strategically from law enforcement, uh, we have to start taking this terrorism threat and some of these extremist threats more seriously. We're not going to get there from where we are now. We're not going to get there under sequestration, for example. You know, you need to have a strong offense. You've got to have, that's coupled with a strong defense. These things, um, we've had over 130 mass shootings this year alone. Right. There's no indication that this is going to stop. This is continually ramping up. And whether it's in Paris and now whether it's here, um, sadly, this war, or whatever you want to call it, is coming home, and we're going to have to learn to address that. And that, I think, significantly in this country and with our our freedom that we adore, uh, that is something that we have to all talk seriously about. Do you um, then suggest to operators of social establishments like the one in Orlando do you tell them you got to beef up your security? You talk about offense and, and defense. Uh, there were obviously security people in the in the building, but they weren't necessarily armed or or of a, a police a training perspective. Do you tell them you got to beef that up? I don't think necessarily that, but I, I we as citizens here in the U.S need to be more vigilant. Every every mass casualty active shooter incident that we've had here in the United States, somebody knew about before it happened. Mm-hmm. And that goes back, if you see something, hear something, say something. Um, too often, people are afraid to come forward if they, they may think it's something small, but that small thing could stop the next Orlando Mm-hmm. So most of the time, the reason they don't is because they don't think it it really is credible, or they don't know what they're what they have access to as far as information. Uh, oftentimes, that may be the case, but mm-hmm. uh, we've seen here locally uh, a month or so ago, just before spring break, we had uh, three inst- incidents at three different local school systems uh, with threats of violence. Mm-hmm. All three of those were handled handled quickly because somebody said something 
We'll come right back in just a minute with Chief Jim Blocker and Sheriff Matt Sachs. Today. Okay, Chief Jim Blocker and Sheriff Matt Saxon with us today. See something, hear something, say something. Uh, and we alluded just before the break there that sometimes we don't know what we're seeing and we're hearing. is, And maybe there's a concern that we give you information that turns out to be nothing or seems frivolous. Uh, how do you help folks sort through that in their minds? Well, you know, and I, and I would say let that be our problem. Let us at least take a look at it. And sometimes, even in this case in Orlando, uh, if, what we're learning is this, this person was, was looked at. Uh, he was investigated, but based on the constraints of the laws at the time, they couldn't do much with it. But at least he was looked at. And that's what I would say. Don't allow that to be an excuse. Go ahead and take the time. If you see something that looks wrong or off, say something. Let us know. And let it, let it be our responsibility to look into it. Because sometimes we simply don't know. And if we're not sure, we'll pass it up to the right folks to take a look at it. You know, identification, uh, interdiction, and then education, those are the kinds of things that are keep our community safer. Not certainly safe. We can't guarantee it. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge. You, you asked earlier about how do you secure these mass events. They're such target-rich environments. That's the problem. You've got a large gathering of people, and that is just one of these new layers that now law enforcement personnel, emergency services personnel, everyone really has to, behind the scenes, start to prepare for. It's something that we're quietly and confidently preparing for and looking into, and it's not so much what happens, it's what happens after it happens that counts, and that's really where we're going to be judged, and that's really how we try to prepare as we move forward. So when you say, let us worry about uh, the veracity of something you think you've seen or you may know, is that a 911 call when you think you know something, or is that uh, a different sort of general number dispatch kind of call? Well, if the threat is imminent and the, the facts that you may know uh, appears imminent, mm -hmm. by all means, yes, call 911. Call our non-emergency number into the center, which is 781 zero nine one one oh, okay. um or silent observer if you want to give information uh but don't you want to remain anom anonymous uh do that it, the bottom line at the end of the day see something say something all right we're talking with chief jim blocker and sheriff matt saxon in a moment we'll come back and talk a little bit about a, another unfortunate story that uh, resulted in something i read that indicated that Law enforcement loses more officers to suicide than they do in the line of duty, which is a very striking thought. And uh, we'll talk about that when we come back in just a minute on WB. BCK, we're here with Chief Jim Blocker and Sheriff Matt Saxton. And, uh, you know, it, it's certainly true that um, we salute law enforcement because, and emergency responders in general, because very often that which you see and deal with are um, very difficult scenes and difficult circumstances day in and day out over and over. Uh, our most recent um, story that made the news, of course, is the loss of a, of a deputy as a result of a murder-suicide, which uh, you were quoted, Sheriff, as saying this was not something you saw coming and uh, you knew this person fairly well. Uh, I think that happens to a lot of us uh, who might know someone who decides to take their own life. We don't. We don't pick up on the clues. And so as a result of reading about that, I, I read that we lose more law enforcement officers to suicide than we do uh, as a result of the job they do every day. That's a startling situation. Do You, you, you must have encountered that uh, notion before. Well, and the unfortunate thing is it's within the last few years is just becomes something that law enforcement – uh, emergency response personnel are starting to look into. Hmm. Um, in this, th there is no federal stats on on the officer suicide. Wow. Uh, there's been some informal studies and numbers collected, uh, but that number does appear to be twice as many uh, law enforcement personnel taking their own lives than we lose in the line of duty on an annual basis. Wow, that's an incredible number. Chief, does that surprise you? Well, no, it doesn't. And, you know, not every call ends when the paperwork's filed. 
uh, PTSD is far more rampant in law enforcement than anyone is really willing to discuss. And I, you know, I want to add here, certainly emergency services providers in general, you know, paramedics, fire, uh, emergency room personnel. We right. have to, dispatchers, we have to add all of those folks and certainly witnesses and folks that witness some of the traumatic events that happen every day in this nation. Uh, as the sheriff said, PTSD statistics for law enforcement are hard to obtain. Uh, they range from 4 to 14 percent. Hmm. Now, the discrepancy in the range may be due to underreporting, and and not only just underreporting, but it's it's also the fact that it's hard to get folks to even report it in the self-report. No one wants to talk about their conditions. We operate in an environment with a bunch of folks that are Type A, and and uh, they they don't see it as being courageous to step forward and say, "I need help." Whereas I can tell you, I know the sheriff, and and certainly me, and many other law enforcement leaders. We look at that as an important. First step. One, it is our it's a leader responsibility to try to recognize the signs, which we'll talk about those here in shortly. Yeah. But more importantly, when someone's willing to step forward and say, I need help, you know, it's all hands on deck. We're certainly willing to give them all the help and support that they need. And, and that's really a hard person or position for a chief or a sheriff or any command staff. Uh, and I've firsthand experienced it this past week right. or past week and a half. Um, staff members, whether you're friends with them on the outside or not, are reluctant if the sheriff comes up and asks, hey, how are you doing? Why? The answer is always, I'm good. Uh-huh. You know, we're, and, and that's been that way in law enforcement for the 23 years I've been in and long before that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, What's it's, behind it's that? It's more of a... Uh, a macho thing yeah, or, right. you know, I'm, I'm good. But uh, the men and women, women in law enforcement or fire, EMS, dispatch, see things, hear things, smell things on a daily basis. And, and that's just not one incident. I mean, you can go from uh, covering a death investigation uh, to uh, MDOP to a, a a mailbox, a mm-hmm. damage to a mailbox, yeah, your right. calls just, and you have to leave that one high stress situation to go deal with damage to a mailbox. Mm-hmm. And then you may get called to uh, a, another medical to assist on it. Just could be anything. day after day after day of seeing things, hearing things, smelling things mm-hmm. uh, can add up. We are doing a better job of that. In law enforcement, I think today than 23 years ago when I started, we do uh, critical incident uh, debriefings uh, at the sheriff's office. We have an employee assistance program that is available to every employee, uh, and it's available. Uh, they can reach out and get that uh, help, or whether it's a financial issue or or uh, a psychological issue, they can uh, quietly reach out, get that assistance. Uh, and, and I stress that to my staff often. Uh, it's, the employee assistance program is there for you. Take advantage of it uh, because I care about each one of my employees. I care about each one of Chief Blocker's employees. Uh, we, If you're struggling, yeah. we want you to get the help. And, and if there is a notion that it's difficult to admit that you're struggling to someone in a superior position, w- whether that's because of the machismo or, or whether it's because you hate to admit that to your boss, uh, then the opportunity to do so anonymously through a, a third party is probably very key. It, it is key. You know, and again, getting back to, I think folks look at it as a sign of weakness, did not ex- not share what they feel is a weakness in something that they see or how they are feeling, uh, but rather we need, we're working hard. I know both of us and leaders in law enforcement are working and in the military are working hard to try to change that narrative to say actually it's, rather it's a sign of strength, being willing to recognize there's something you're dealing with, because you know all of these are team sports. Uh, we look for folks even when they during when we're looking at them and hiring and recruiting, we're looking for folks that are involved in team-based events. Hmm. And that, that follows, the, that's in our culture. And so what, when we have a team member that that's, 
having a problem that may be unseen. We want them to come forward just like they would back <laughs> in the playing field. And sure. This is a team sport, and working together is key. And so when you're ready, we can talk more about those signs and symptoms that we look for. Okay. And, and just one small story to add to that. I mean, and Jim and I, Chief and I went through that as we grew up through the agency, yeah. and, and we still do. Um, law enforcement don't really talk about what they did when they go home to their families. or I mean, they keep it in. They want to bring it, them into uh, it, yeah. 20 mm -hmm. years ago, I... Uh, covered a family of four that was killed on I-94. Uh, a milk truck rolled over on their vehicle in the winter. They were going to buy a puppy. Oh, my. Um, you know, that didn't affect me that day. Two years after that, my oldest son was born, and it all flooded back in. Uh, you know, it's when I realized I was a father, it and changed. I remember... That family of four. I, I went home and cried that night mm -hmm. when my son was born. Right. Yeah, so it may not affect you now, but you store it away, and it might affect you later. Yeah, we didn't get to those those signs, but uh, I think your your comments are well uh, are well uh, received in, in that uh, this is a, a challenge, but working together is, is key to all that. We'll stay in touch. Thanks to the both of you. Thanks. Thank you. Eight thirty.